Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Bruce's Beast. Tonight, I have a an awesome guest, uh, one of my probably the first actual YouTube beekeeper I ever met way back in, I think it was 2014 or 2015, uh, Mr. Yappy Bee Man. Yappy, introduce yourself to us and a little bit. I think most people probably know you, but but tell us who you are and, and what you're all about. Uh, Bruce, I so much appreciate you asking me to come on here and uh, just kind of, you know, have the chat time. This is awesome. Uh, I am, yes, Yappy Bee Man. Uh, Mom calls me son. My kids call me dad and everybody else in the world just calls me Yappy. Um, but I, I have been primarily a honeybee remover from anything they get themselves into, well, probably about 10 years plus, been a beekeeper for about 12, and things just uh, things just kind of grew for me back some time ago, and been very, very blessed with the, the channel, the product that I put out as far as the, the videos, and the acceptance in the community of Yappy Bee Man and my kind of crazy personality. I'm a career fireman. Uh, husband, father, and bee remover, uh, YouTube creator, which ends up being about 27 different uh, labels that you could put on. Just depends on whether I'm holding a camera or in front of a laptop. So you're busy. A little bit. <laughs> um, I'll just say that. So uh, probably five hours ago, I was shoulder deep into a six foot deep hive that I could only get from the outside up underneath a little hangover on a split level house. Generally, this is one that'll get you. The folks that are in the uh, bee removal business, we all kind of tend to laugh a little bit because the homeowner just noticed the bees last week. So because they just noticed them, they've been there for a week to them. And we get in there and we come to find out, no, nah, they've actually been here for about two or three years and they swear there's no way to do it, but you know, we don't argue. And my customer said, you know, that they, they've known the bees to be there for about two years and now getting the house ready to get it sold and thought they probably should get rid of them and pull down a little overhang and there's plenty of comb there. And some of it, look, you know, like it's been there this season, but then just get past that first white comb and it immediately it just turned chocolate brown. And I'm going, holy cow, they've been here a little bit longer than two years, most, most likely about five we ended up, we pulled a bunch of bees out of that, caught our queen. Uh, we had to vacuum her because when you get into doing this, they'll run sometimes. So as she was probably another four feet in and I was putting an extension on my vacuum hose to try to catch her, uh, we were successful in that. We found her in the catch box and got back home and put them in a hive. We'll see where that goes from there. And uh, hurry up, grab everything so I can hang out with you and, and uh, your channel viewers. Appreciate it. Well, that's awesome, man. And that sounds like a story that's been so familiar uh, with your channel, Yappy Bee Man, for all these years. Uh, but recently you started something new, uh, Honey Money TV. And can you talk to us a little bit about how you kind of how you decided to do that and, and why and, and kind of where you where you look to go with the new channel? Well, Honey Money TV was a, a concept that I came up with. I just felt like I wanted to be able to more interact more with people that were the actual beekeepers. Yappy Bee Man and the and the channel that has been created in that with the bee removals and the swarm catches, the interaction with bees. I've I've kind of found that there is a broader audience that are not beekeepers. There are people that are looking at something that just amazes them, but they don't ever want to really get into doing that. So putting out beekeeping type content on that channel just doesn't really work so good for me. I've I've tried it in the past it and there was uh, very little growth in it, as well as if I would throw one in after so many removal videos, um, people it would turn people off and they would just kind of go away from the channel. So I found a, something that, that worked for that concept on that channel. But this, in watching comments, a lot of people wanted to know, well, whatever happened to those bees? How were those bees doing? You know, kind of wanted some updates on those. And the channel's grown from that. I used to just go and I'd remove the bees and I'd finish out, you know, hey, we appreciate you being here. Um, like, subscribe, and, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. Check out another video. And then people would start suggesting, I'd love to see where you put your bees or what they go into or whatever. So we started adding that to the end of our videos. We get there and we, you know, show them going into the hive and different things like that. So the, the channel has grown and the content has gone with it, but I still just needed an opportunity to connect with the beekeeping culture in itself. And that's where the Honey Money TV allows me to do that. It gives me that opportunity where I can get on and do lives. We've done a couple lives so far, and I'm working out the kinks. So uh, that's 
this is very interesting as far as how how things go and we've got a lot of great people that are coming on i've got some ideas where i don't want to i don't want to share some thoughts and processes with the the community and how to do a split or what you should do here or there for me it's i can go live right there in my bee yard and i can i can set the stuff up we go live and I'm going to go through a beehive and I'm going to talk about what I'm seeing and interact with people through the comments and um, just kind of have some fun out in the yard without everybody having to jump up in their car and drive, you know, two, three, four, ten 10 hours just to come hang out with me over a beehive. Yeah, I've noticed in the few videos that you've done that, that you're doing exactly that. In your Yappy Bee Man videos, the removal videos, you're saying, hey, and go over to you, uh, Tiny Money TV and we're going to follow these bees. And I really like that. I think there's all kinds of opportunity for you there. Also on your new channel, um, just last night and you, you know, you had an interview, um, you're just, you're starting to kind of reach out and, and get more involved in some of that. I think that's great. Uh, one thing that I think most people who follow you know is, is you do have one of the larger uh, YouTube beekeeping channels with the Yappy Bee Man. So you do have a, a significant circle of influence. And, and so hopefully you can, you can help some people out who want to follow and learn about the bees, um, besides just the marvel, you know, marveling at them and what they can do in a wall or in a swarm or just some of those basics and the excitement of it. Now you can just break down some nuts and bolts and, and uh, really become a teacher and educator, so to speak, with the bees a little bit. And you, and you have a, you have the heart of a teacher. You have the mind of a teacher. I've known you for years. Um, just a quick story. When I, I think the first time I ever talked to you or I had to have been the first time I reached out to you is way back. I, I believe it was 2014. And uh, there was an open air colony that I was made aware of down here, uh, here in South Alabama. But back then I was watching JP quite a bit and I'd heard of you and, and I knew you were from Alabama and somehow I got a hold of you. I can't remember how I did that, but I had no idea what to do. I sent you a picture of the, of the open air colony and you were like, wow, you were almost about ready to jump in your car and come down here and help me with it, I think. But uh, you actually walked me through kind of how to take care of it, what to do. And then I had a successful removal from that open air colony. It was a huge, just a beautiful open air colony. A, a guy was clearing some land. And uh, he needed to have that thing out of there before he could go. He was in, like in a gully, the tree was sticking up and they were hanging out there. So it's pretty cool. But, you know, I've always been able to reach out to you or ask you a question. You've always been more than willing to, to help me or to talk through things with me. And, and I, I feel like you're probably my oldest friend and, and one of the best friends that I have in this uh, YouTube community and the beekeeping community as a whole. And so I just appreciate your support and your guidance throughout all the years. Yeah, if you even help me out now on some of my videos, you'll you'll give me a suggestion for a title or a thumbnail. And I've actually used quite a few of those suggestions with some with a lot of success. And so I just appreciate your friendship, man. Yeah, it's always, it's always an honor to be asked. It sometimes can be hard to actually have that ability or availability to to jump in there but i, I recall that phone call and and going through that and you nailed it i was i'm i can come i can be there in a couple hours i'm on my way and uh it just didn't it didn't work out to to where that could go through but uh if um, i yeah, if i can find that picture i'll i'll put it on the i'll put it here on the video i'll, yeah. I'll do a um, b-roll of it because it was just a really impressive super impressive colony it was just a lot of fun and and uh great experience for me to do that i've always kind of wanted to drill down a little bit with you yappy and and kind of drill into some of your your basic concepts some of your uh, ideas about beekeeping beyond just the you know the removals i understand obviously to do that you have to understand bees you have to understand and you have to be able, you know how they how they work what they do and and the miracle of it all but i wanted to drill down a little bit and kind of get to know yappy the bee man the beekeeper a little bit more deeply and so i've got a I guess a term or a, a phrase that I, I like to use in my beekeeping. I've, I've tried to kind of focus on this a little bit the last couple of years. The term is intentional beekeeping. Yep. If you could kind of give me an idea of, of how you would define intentional beekeeping uh, in your operation. Wow. That's actually the, a really cool question. Intentional beekeeping. What I think right off the cuff, obviously beekeeping with purpose, but in that purpose, I would ask, is it for the entire program? I mean, if, we, if I was talking with somebody and, and, I, and I presented that same question to them, I would ask, are you developing a program for your entire yard, your entire season, or for each individual colony? Because each individual colony has uh, could, could slightly be managed differently because they offer you different signs and, and things that are going on. Every, every beehive is its own person, its own world. And on the intentional beekeeping side, I would believe that we have to set a plan for our season, a plan for our growth in regards to uh, honey production or bee production, you know, breaking it down to what, what is my, what is my goal this year? How will I make my money? How will I make increases 
it's almost like you ask the question at the top and then we start breaking that down and it almost looks like you know the uh the sweet 16 basketball uh uh lines going out you know who's playing who because you can you, it's it's a tree it's a fork you could you could vary off into so many different branches in that honestly intentional beekeeping for me is having an entire purpose for the 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 three the what do i want for my season what am i trying to produce the most of and what can i get the most out of each individual colony okay so that's perfect because my next question was going to be what are the three most important things with intentional beekeeping? And so why don't we address each one of those um, and kind of give us some pointers, some ideas of what you think. And we'll start off with the entire season. Yappy. When you're thinking of intentional beekeeping, how could you apply that term to your beekeeping season? Uh, intentional beekeeping in regards to an entire season for me is what is my end goal? Obviously, for most, if not all beekeepers, it's going to be to have good, strong colonies that uh, will make it through dearth and have minimal work to deal with but obviously planning for the, the the next season when you're in the middle of your flow you're too busy managing once we get past flow then we're trying to figure out what we can harvest from and what we have to do with those bees seasonal intentional beekeeping is just the goals for the entire yard whether it be honey production or increases of your numbers or to increase those numbers to sell them, increase those numbers for next year's honey production. It's think about what a, a honeybee colony does. They work with a purpose and they nothing sets them back other than maybe weather or temperature. But nature has given them a point blank, this is what we do. At this age, I do this. At this age, I do this. And then at this age, I go and you know, forage and bring back until until I'm not here anymore. It's a constant, but they never wait for the beekeeper. So if we as beekeepers will look at how we we are managing our, our, our yard as a whole through the time we have to invest and the amount that we are managing and we work that balance out, we can repeat that number, but we're having to stay ahead of the, of the bees. If we don't, they get ahead of us, and now you're pulling half your bees out of a tree. So in intentional beekeeping for a season, I'm looking at what is my goal for the next year so that I can stay ahead of those bees and I can work um, to grow to, to reach that but a year sooner. I'm, I'm thinking about it this year and I'm working it this year to reach that goal for next spring. Absolutely. How many splits you make, how much you want to grow, and uh, actually looking at the financial considerations as well, you know, if you're trying to grow a business, all those things are important. Um, so you mentioned one of the first things you mentioned there was, you know, obviously I think right now, um, if we're not in the middle of the season, we're coming up on it pretty quickly. I think down here in the South, we're kind of beginning to have the season. I noticed some privet. I walked out of the hospital this afternoon and I could have that. I smelled that privet in the air. So it's starting to bloom wow. down here, just starting to, I haven't seen a lot of it, but boy, I smelled it. You know, it's that distinct smell that you have when privet is in full bloom. And so we are, we are in beekeeping season here. It's just getting started. You know, we've been kind of in and out here the last month or two with the with the little mini flows and then the weather's been kind of crazy, but we're in it now. And so right now, you know, is, is the fun time of the beekeeping season for me. Everything's happening. The bees are tend to be happier. They're doing what they're put on earth to do. You know, they're working hard, but you mentioned uh, the dearth season. It always comes at least for me right at the end of the honey flow. So what kinds of things do you do to prepare to have strong bees going into the dearth so they will survive and come out of it stronger on the other end. This is a secret that I have kept for 12 years. And since it's just me and you here right now, you know, we're just working yeah. on this. I'm pretty nope, sure nope. nobody, nobody no better place that. to, sh no better place to share it than right here on Bruce's bees. Well, <laughs> what's, what's very interesting is that I choose not to harvest honey in June. It, this, this goes back to what my management and my goals are for my yard. And I think a season ahead. My season that I'm thinking of right now is we're supposed to be changing the seasonal yearly weather patterns. We were in, we're coming out of an El Nino, gives us a lot more moisture throughout the, that season. October through winter into early spring gives us more rain. If you have paid attention in your particular area to what those seasonal differences are, um, we're coming into a La Nina. From what I understand, if I if I'm right, I, I looked it up. I'm pretty sure we're coming into a La Nina, and that kind of changes up how much rain and how much different, how much moisture we're going to get. Moisture equates to how much we're going to get out of the ground as far as the nectar through the plants and the different things. So we've had a lot of rain. I expect a huge flow. 
I think we're going to have a great season this year. But I have to manage that and keep from having swarms. But all of a sudden now I've got a ton of honey sitting on my boxes. I'm going to look and say, do I have a box? Do I have a, a box that's sitting out there that have three, four, five mediums sitting on them? And do I want to let that sit through dirt? Do I want to have a problem with that? Robbing if I get into all this. So my big secret is that I just, for the most part, I may take off some, but not very much. While other beekeepers are going in, they're pulling their honey. And now you've got to sit and keep your feet bees fed and do all the different things during that summer window. And then it doesn't rain. We have the worst dry season like we did last year here in Alabama. Now you go into your fall flow, your golden rods, your fall plants, weeds, and different things. But they're so dry, you're not going to, the bees just can't really collect anything from it. Well, you've got honey sitting in a jar that you're selling for X amount of dollars a jar. But every every jar you sell, you're going to save $2 off of because you're going to have to go feed your bees through the rest of the winter. I have gone seasons to where, and I'm fortunate, and not everybody can do this, but I, I make primarily my money on doing removals. I will sell a very small amount of five prime nucleus colonies um, to very select people who will call and say, hey, you got one available? Yeah, I do. It may be 15 or 20, but I don't do 200. So I get a little bit extra from that. It helps to buy some new equipment. And then I, I will let my bees rock and roll. The Honey Money Channel has created an opportunity where now I have to go out there and do a lot more in my bees to where I usually let them just kind of kind of be. I'll check them every couple of weeks unless there's a change in the flow window and I know that we're about to have a problem. Um, I need to add space, make splits, do some of that same work everybody else does. But now we get to the end of that flow and if I've got a heavy flow, then I can pull some boxes off and I can do a, I can do a small run of honey and get it, get it in the buckets and, and have it on standby, you know, to, to sell. But I leave a majority of it on my colonies because I don't have to worry about feeding them through dirt. I don't have to uh, worry as much if we don't have a fall flow. And I feel comfortable gauging that fall flow based on the amount of rain that we've had. And I mean, I got a field of 37 acres of goldenrod right next to me. And I can walk out there and I can feel those plants and say, you know, this, the pollen on this just feels so dry that it's not going to do them a whole lot of good. And if the pollen's dry or break a branch and it doesn't have a lot of moisture in, in that, you know, in that stalk or at those roots, then I can, I, I can feel like it's, well, if I pull any more honey, they're going to starve and I'm going to lose colonies through winter. I like that approach. And I know that's a, an approach a lot of people take, especially if honey is not their primary goal. I did have an experience about the same time, maybe a year later than when uh, we, we first uh, talked over the phone. And uh, I had three colonies down here just in my same neighborhood. Kind of got a friend down there that we had three colonies down there. And man, that was a wonderful honey year. It was, I was just once again pretty new at beekeeping, didn't really know what I was doing. And I'd order some queens from a friend up in Indiana, Tim Ives, who I, I like the way he did his bees. You know, he has yeah. his monster colonies and is, is a real successful honey producer. And so I'm like, well, that's the only time I've ever been able to get, ever been able to get queens out of them. He's always... This, this is tough to get queens out of the guy. And the queens I got were really good queens. Uh, the problem was um, I ordered those queens in August. Um, August 6th was my birthday, I think, when I was supposed to get them or right around my birthday. And a couple days beforehand, I went down and I'm, I, my thought process was I'm going to leave all the honey on these colonies. They were, I think, probably double deeps with probably two or three honey super stacked on top. You know, we had a really good fly that year, if I remember correctly. So, like, you know, my thought process was I'll just leave all the honey on there and then they'll, they'll be strong coming out of winter. And next year they'll be even better. So I went down to prepare my splits and, and, um, you know, I went down and checked on, they look strong. Went down to prepare my splits as the queens, saw, as the queens were arriving and there was the biggest swarm I've ever seen up in a tree and they had absconded. The hive beetles had destroyed the colonies had gotten in there. And, you know, so I, what I, what I discovered then was I feel like I need to pull at least some honey off or else if there's too much honey and too much for the bees to defend that time of the year it can be pretty difficult at least down here in this area in certain spots and it's not that way everywhere but i do have certain areas where the high bills seem to be worse than others it's always a challenge to figure out what the best thing to do is in each individual beekeeper situation but also in each individual yard each individual location it can be different from spot to spot that's part of the thing that is frustrating about beekeeping but it's also it also makes it a challenge and makes it fun well, i have followed so much of bruce's bees over the over the course of time it was probably Bruce's maybe his second going into his third year, and Bruce drove me nuts. I, I there was a there was a point in time where I actually would dog cuss him, and and it was in a nice way. 
You probably but still I, do that. You probably still do that. No, no, no. Okay. So <laughs> Bruce had this, there was a business or something. There's all I remember was this long block wall and there was this one tree sitting next to it. And when I was gearing up for season, Bruce is literally, um, two hours. No, you are probably more like three or four hours. I'm caught three or four hours south of me. So yeah. it was nice having the connection with Bruce because when Bruce would start sharing swarm pictures or this or that i was like okay I'm, I'm i'm watching time frames because i know he's that far so you know now now i'd watch to see who's posting you know maybe in montgomery pretty pretty soon after that then the birmingham so i knew when i should when, I, when it's like man my phone's gonna ring tomorrow because it's a hot, bright sunny day and we're right in that window that here comes the swarm calls and uh, bruce would get on facebook and he would share, it was almost every other day he was sharing swarm catches from this one particular location. And it seemed like it was just every day. He was, he had his box set up there. He put some swarm commander in the box. And, it, you know, then it, it was like, you just pulled a swarm out of that thing yesterday. And there's another one. And he was killing it. But, uh, yeah, oh, I was so mad, jealous, because because he would never share where that wall was. I'm just saying. But uh, Yeah, it was, uh, well, uh that place it was at a, a local business and um they had a friend that managed the business next to the place where the bees were in the wall and there were several colonies in that center block wall and so i was telling me a couple of swarm traps on the other side of that building and uh, i mean it just i think it just cast swarms out constantly and they they ended yeah. up having someone coming and filled all the holes where the bees were in the cinder blocks and so that shut down but i still i haven't put a trap out there in a while i'm not even sure if that guy still works there um, the nails are still on the trees. I could probably do it. Nobody would know, but, um, but I caught even for two or three years after that, I continued to hang traps. And even after they sealed up the bees, I still caught swarms there consistently in that spot. It was just a really good spot. That's where I learned how to do swarm trapping. And, uh, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I haven't done a lot of swarm trapping in recent years. I always, I set out like this year, I've already caught a couple of swarms just in, in colonies. I set out in the bee yards with swarm commander in them. You know, just to have there in case some of my bees swarm. I've caught a couple of swarms that way already, but I, I do so many splits now, and I I just grow my bees in different ways now. I don't feel like I have to put out a lot of swarm traps, but um, it, it's a lot of fun. It's like fishing, you know. It's really cool when you go out there and yeah. catch a swarm. It's, it's not a bad idea because that way you can also hopefully improve or, or add variation to your genetics as well. If you hang traps in areas where your bees aren't, you know, you can you can catch bees from other areas and maybe help add some diversity to your stock but i think i got so much diversity in my bees it's not a problem i've got bees feral bees I've, bought, I've ordered queens i've got bees from all over the place in my bees so i got all kinds of stuff i'm um, going in my situation um the next you, you mentioned uh the seasonal aspect of it that was one of your first uh, three things that you would uh, focus on with intentional beekeeping and uh that's that's critically important and, and you mentioned the seasons as far as the weather and, and anticipating things but also i think you know, just from a financial, from a business perspective, that's important too. You have to, especially if it is a business for you, you have to be intentional with that. And that's one thing I'm not real good at. You know, I kind of make sure I have the equipment I need and, and make the bees I need. And then I sell the honey. I try to stay in the black, but I need to, if I become more of a businessman to where it's more of uh, a percentage of my actual income, I'll need to become much more intentional about that as well. Um, yeah, as far as a, from a business perspective, I know you mentioned a little bit about your bees, the removals. Is there any other uh, things that you do to help increase or promote your business besides your YouTube and your removals. And then you mentioned a few nukes. Is there anything else you do? There's not much more that I do other than the, the primary is the removal side. I enjoy the interaction through the socials with people as far as their issues or thought processes about bees and answering questions. Um, you know, we all love the bug, but right now I'm, I'm pretty much tapped. It's primarily the, the removal side of it. And I hate to admit it, but I'm, I ain't getting too much younger and it's getting oh, to the point now yeah. where it is hard climbing a ladder to have to, to, to do some of this stuff. And, you know, it just works on your body in, in ways, but um, we're, we've done, I think I've done right about six, seven, maybe eight different removals. And there was one or two of them that I wish that I had recorded after I got them done. But doing a removal is, is, hard enough to do it right um to to take your time do it right uh, you know if anybody knows me you know i am just crazy about catching my queen i want i won't leave till i know i've seen her in the box where i've caught her by hand i, I want that's just my goal but but going through the process you know it, it 
you get up in the morning, you got to load everything up. You drive, you get there, you do a job, you get done, you got to bring everything back, you got to clean half the stuff that you were there. Um, you know, getting covered in blah plus the honey that goes along with it. It, it makes for it makes for a pretty hard day. On top of that, trying to run a bee yard, I have I always get asked this one question: How many how many hives do you run? Because people see me so deep into bees, you would think I'm running, you know, 200, 500 beehives. My management process is I know my limitations, and my limitations won't give me more time than to keep 25 beehives. And that's just what I have done, and I've done it for years, because if I get any more than that, I can't properly give them the attention to manage them the way that they need to. So if it's not treating them at the right time or dealing with hive beetles at the right time or adding or reducing space at the right time you know you're a swarm leaves and you've just lost a large amount of money so what's the point in having 500 hives sitting there if you can't manage them so you know i, I know what my limitations are i uh i've been very blessed with my being more more known and i have a lot of beekeepers in the state of alabama that they definitely want to do what's right by bees and a friend will call and say, Hey, I got bees and they will refer them to call me because they've, people have seen my content. They know what I do and how, and, and how I treat people in regards to being a customer. And that's just kind of where I keep things limited. I think that's smart. Actually, you know, one of my problems is I just, I just love growing. I love challenging myself. And sometimes I challenge myself right out of good beekeeping practices. <laughs> so, well, uh, as a, as a compliment to you, I have, I have watched your endeavors, I guess you would say, over the years. And, you know, we were referring back to you catching a lot of the swarms. And um, you have shared your backyard, your little, what I call your mini apiary of, what, 8, 10, 15 hives you keep in, literally in your backyard. Um, but I have watched throughout the years how your program has changed. Oh, you yeah, have adapted sure. in so many different ways. There was, um, it was funny that you brought up Tim Ives. You know, Tim Ives was very popular in the socials back, you know, 10 years ago because he had a math equation on how he did what he did. He ran triple deep colonies and he, his math equation, I mean, he literally could calculate how many bees would be in that box at what time, what week, what month. Um, it was, it was a, it was a great thought process. And I watched Bruce follow Tim Ives in so many different ways, actually, say, well, this is what I'm going to do. And and Bruce did that. He literally, you know, went and was stacking triple deeps and, you know, 17 mediums on top of that and catching honey, you know. And mm -hmm. But Bruce, Bruce was never afraid to look at something, try it, and say, well, this really doesn't work for me or this is amazing. I'm going to, you know, I, I, I'm, I can do this. And uh, you have grown. I mean, what was it, last year? Bruce finally got to a point where he was putting bees on pallets and sending them to almonds. He grew and he's learned and he was, he was not afraid to try something and he put forth the work to do it. So in, in the beekeeping side of this, I watched you grow and you've done a great job at it, you know, and that, and that, that does get you to a point where you can, um, you know, you could be on a stream with a couple other guys and, and you can speak with authority because you've never just been somebody who sat there and went, okay, I've got a single, uh, deep and I'm going to put an excluder and I'm going to run 17 mediums on that. And, um, that's all, you know, Good, you know, yeah, yeah. I've never been afraid to, to try things and I've, I've never been afraid of growth, but then the problem has been when I grow too big. So that's been, you know, uh, Ian Stepper has a video that's called the, the 10 day rule. I don't know if you've ever seen that video, but that's one of my favorites in the beekeeping world, actually, because the principles he talks about in there or just spot on. The overall principle is that, that you're going to end up with as many bees as you can manage, no matter how much you grow, no matter how much you do. If you can't manage them, you will, you will only end up with as many colonies as you can actually uh, hold on to. In other words, if you, if you're a hundred hive beekeeper, but you, if, but you grow to 175, you'll end up a hundred colony beekeeper because you just can't keep up with the stuff that needs to be done. And um, anyway, if you ever get a chance, uh, I'll, I'll, I may throw a link to this in my description. Uh, the 10 day rule from Ian Stepper. So about oh, a few years ago, he made the video, but it makes a lot of sense. It's a short video. He explains that principle. It's, it's really a good video. And it, it talks about just kind of making sure that you take care of what needs to be taken care of within a, basically within 10 days of what it needs to be taken care of. You got 10 days to accomplish any goal, whether it be treating for mites, whether it be uh, harvesting honey, whatever it is, you can't get more than 
10 days behind or, or, you know, you'll just start losing bees. And so that's a very broad description of it. It, it, He explains it much better than that, but it's, it's really cool. So I'd recommend, yeah, if you go watch it, if you haven't, and anybody else who may be watching this, that'd be great. We've already talked a little bit about production. You, you know, how you, I guess you produce, um, honey is not your primary source of income. And so that's, that's interesting. And I do agree that it is, it is wise to leave enough honey on the hives to get through winter. Um, I don't, I, you know, I used to be opposed to feeding. I didn't like to feed that much, but now I've learned I'm not opposed to that anymore. Um, I've had good success with doing that. I'm still trying to figure out the, the dearth period in the summer is when I really, really struggle. I work so hard in the spring to, to get the bees built up and to get the honey super stacked and to get that honey coming in and harvest the honey. That by the time I get the honey off the colonies, that's about the time the high beetles are starting to catch their stride and the, you know, the, the mites are starting to catch their stride. And that's when it's so critical, you know, to really get on top of those pests and those diseases in order to have stronger colonies. And then if you pull the honey off and you don't make sure they have enough food, everything can just come to a head all at once. And that's when you can really start losing colonies. And, and for me, most of the time that occurs, there's like a delay. There's like a, a lag, like I'll harvest honey. Everything looks pretty good. And then about two month, about a month or two later is when the colonies start crashing. And so that's, that's really when you need to pick it up, be vigilant and make sure that you're, you're managing all those things. So I thought we might just move into that area, uh, Yappy, when it comes to, we, we talked a little bit about the dearth already in your food, food uh, philosophy, I guess, with keeping some food on there. But what do you do to control the pests, the mites, the beetles and things like that? What else do you do to, to make sure your bees are healthy and strong getting through the dearth and on into the fall and winter? Over the years, I've had multiple different size colonies. Um, getting past the June window, I've always kept my bees in, in a window where they're, they're pretty much full sun for about 75% of the day. One of my management processes will be that once we get past that flow, I've, I've done all kinds of different things. There was multiple seasons where I went down and I bought a roll of window screen. And I would take that window screen and I would cut it to, the, to be just a little bit bigger than the top of the beehive. And I would, I would put screen on top of it so that I could actually vent out the top you know, with a short crack in there, but not allow um, hive beetles to get in there. It was just kind of, a, it, it made me feel better that I wasn't leaving this big wide open space because one of the big things that beekeepers are going to do once with, once we get past the flow, we got washboarding going on with the front and things are, you know, with all the bees are home, there's nothing really out there for them to get. They're, they're locked and loaded on that front door. They're protecting it. They're trying to keep everything out, but they're also trying to circulate that air. And for me, I have found that the more the hives will be out in the sun and get that opportunity to heat up, I, I've, I've seen I have not had major issues with the hive beetles. I'm going to get them. We're all going to get them. Um, but I would still not, I don't like to leave that top open. So, I, you know, I went for a lot of seasons putting screen on there. And then uh, I would reduce an entrance down to make it a little bit smaller, you know, just all kind of different effects. I hate to say it this way. It, there's no real one great answer on something. You get to a point and you're seeing, you see the signs of what this particular colony is going through. We've got, you know, warm temperatures and a lot of bees and it's strong. And I've got, I mean, literally gray beards just hanging off the front of it when you got three pounds of bees hanging off the front of a hive. And, you know, it scares you. Well, they're managing it. They're doing what they need to do. No matter what I did, they were adjusting or doing something with. I was, I thought I was trying to help them out and they could pretty much handle it on their own anyway. So I kind of sit back and I'm, I really let things happen, but I watch for certain particular things. There's no flow. We get a lot of bees. I need to make sure that everybody has got food on them in, in one form or fashion. My weaker colonies, I just bust them down. There's no reason to have a weak colony sitting in your bee yard after your flow is over with because whatever is there is going to get robbed out. Weak colonies, are they're doomed anyway. And if my strong colonies are bored, and they find a weakness in a colony, they're going to they're going to do what they can to get over to get to that. And before you know it, there's really nothing left in there. Next thing you know, you've got wax moths all up in it and you've ruined resources. So I will reduce things down, pack them in, make it to where I've got super beards and plenty of food. And I just let them work that out. Two weeks after I know that privet's done with, and we have a lot of wildflowers in the area, 
if we've got the rain still coming and and the, the ground is moist I, I let them keep gathering it's smaller amounts but they're gathering but once we get to a point where they're not really bringing anything in and they've got huge beards on the front of them i, I don't mind reducing things down I'd, I'd rather hang, hang all the way outside but i'll I reduce them down so that we don't have an opportunity for while they're all outside that the hive beetles can figure out how to get through there. We understand hive beetles. The bees can't really do anything with them except corner them. They don't have from what I've seen. And if that, if I'm wrong, tell me. But the 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 things that I've seen is is they'll sit there and they chase them and they corner them up and and they stress out trying to keep them there so that they keep them off the comb. Well, that's the same thing. What happens? You've got a big beard of bees hanging there. If a hive beetle's coming in because they're they're now in that window of going crazy, they'll get in there. All your bees are outside bearding, and the hive beetles are having a great time inside that colony. So, yeah. you, got, you know, there's something to watch for. But uh, um, I'll, I'll reduce stuff down. I try, to, I try not to give them too much space to not be on during those summertime months. And, and it's worked out pretty good for me. Yeah, I think the uh, you kind of hit the nail on the head there. That's one of the reasons I, I do pull. Well, I pull honey because I need the honey, but also... You can help reduce some of that space for the bees to cover when you do that. Although you do want to leave them some food, you don't want to leave too much. You know, if you leave three supers of three or four supers of honey on a on a colony, sometimes the, they just can't. You know, as, they, as they start to decrease in population, as the the bees start to die off, you know, and they start to kind of go into that drop back and pound, or let's just let's just wait this thing out mode, and they don't produce as many bees, then the, there becomes more space in the colony for the the beetles to get in there and wreak havoc and. Yeah, the heat and everything to it. It's just a it's just a perfect storm for pests to get in there. Um, but I like your thought of reducing them down, making sure you got plenty of bees hanging on the outside. It, it's got to be a little more difficult for the beetles to get in with bees, you know, cl- you know, all around the entrance and everywhere. Um, the other issue is mites. Uh, I know that some of the the guys that kind of are um, specializing in bee removals, a lot of them don't really do a lot of treating and don't do a lot of mite um, treatments. They kind of just let the bees kind of do their thing. Is that kind of your philosophy as well, or do you go ahead and kind of treat for mites and, and test and do all that kind of stuff with your bees? I've never, I don't, I don't subscribe to treatment or treatment for either way. I subscribe to you, t- you look at a colony and you read the signs and you figure out what's wrong, you know, figure out what it needs. So when I first, my in my earlier days of doing the removals, I would, I would cut comb. I would rubber band it in the frames. You put it in the box. I tell you, you know that uh, old, old Texas Bee Works girl. She between JP and JP taught me, and then I was doing it. She learned how to do it pretty simple. Was you know, putting the bees in the frame and rubber banding it in, and you know it all went great. But here's where the problem with that is: is that you're bringing home whatever issues they had with them. It's, it's it's easier for me to vacuum and collect up five pounds of bees. And toss every bit of that comb in a trash bag, melt it down later, and reuse that wax. But get those bees home, put them on, put them in a five frame nuke, stick some sugar water on top of them, a small little bit of pollen because they've got to have some food. You know, mm-hmm. for the first four or five days, I'm gonna I'm gonna feed them. They need that resource both to eat as well as to to draw comb. I want them to rebuild, and I just gave my bees what I feel is a brood break. You know, so they they get that. But early in when I was reusing comb. I'd put it in there. It wouldn't take them a day, and they already had everything fastened up. I could just go back in there, and I could remove rubber bands, and most of the time they would just go ahead and cut them and do it for me. It was no big deal. But I never could get a beehive to live longer than two years. Occasionally, very, very rarely would I get three seasons out of a colony. Then we had um, oxalic acid got introduced. You know, I wasn't really into the whole treating. I wasn't putting all these other different things in, but oxalic acid came along, and it made sense with what I was reading. It's an it's something that they naturally dealt with, and um, they have their levels that they can they can take versus the the things that we were trying to treat for, and it made sense. So I kind of stepped into the treatment world, but I did it because I was tired of losing bee colonies. So there was one Saturday I walked out and I started shaking off a cup full of bees, and I you know I process it the way I do it, and I take this jar and I'm spinning this jar. I'm counting one, two, seventeen, eighteen, twenty one mites off of this one colony, and I went holy cow. So then I went, well, what's this one got? And I get into that colony. I got nineteen. The next one I get into it was somewhere around twenty or twenty one mites in that one as well. 
I said, forget this. I called Bud Wills. I ordered a uh, one of his wands that he was making at the time. Every you know everybody was getting one of those little plug it into a battery and stick it in there. And uh, I treated every colony I had. It was towards the fall when you know it was suggested to do it, and I, I I I did exactly the way it was supposed to go. But then the next year came, and well, I didn't check for mice. I didn't do this, but I I the next year I didn't lose colonies. That winter I didn't lose a single colony. There's factors beside it. It wasn't just because I, I treated with OA that all of them magically made it through, but they did. And I was pretty surprised with that. So I think the next year I may have treated, but then I, I kind of ended up going, I wonder, I mean, the colonies were doing good. They were managed well. And I, I did it different. I didn't just get into where, okay, okay you know, I'm going to treat every fall. I actually went for almost three years and I didn't treat anything, but those same colonies, were still there and they were still they were still stocked um can't say that they did or didn't swarm i mean there's all kind of different factors so it's not just oa was this golden golden goose but i quit losing colonies so i factored it back to one thing i also quit putting cut comb back into these colonies and i was i think i re majorly reduced a lot of mite load in my yard by knocking them down first and then i stopped doing the comb thing and I've got all kind of different management processes that, that you know, some people would, some people wouldn't believe or that would piss them off the way I do some things. But I just look, I look at numbers and I look at strengths of strength of colonies and on an individual basis. And what do I got to do to manage that? I guess as you, as your skill develops as a beekeeper, you learn how to assess the situation. You know, it's almost like a hospital or a doctor's clinic where there's like a triage. You, you crack the lid, you look in there, you can see what the bees look like. You can pull some brood out you can look and you can assess more quickly what's going on as well as you learn some tricks of how to how to assess for mites and how to look where to look for the beetles and you just learn different strategies and that's one thing i think that that i would encourage you know those who may be getting into beekeeping and might be a little bit intimidated or not feel like they know everything understand that the only way to learn is to get in there and just look at what's going on and kind of figure out what works for you and so you've described several things right here yappy and just things that you learn through trial and error and I think that a lot of the guys that are doing removals now are, are they're not doing the comb. You know, from what I can tell, I, I, I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to misrepresent somebody, but it seems like that's what a lot of people are starting to turn to just because it, it does keep you from bringing home the, the diseases and the problems. And so I, I thought if I did get into removals that I would do that. Plus to me, it sounds like it would be much, much less work to just be able to throw the comb in a bag, vacuum the bees and go. Although there's a lot of work involved regardless, but you don't have to worry about that process of getting the rubber bands out, strapping them in the frames. You can just take them and go. And then the bees start with fresh, their own comb that they build when you feed them the sugar water and the food they need to get started. And uh, you really give them, I think, in a lot of ways, the, a better chance or the best chance of survival by doing that. I personally have found, you know, I, I've really been a big fan of oxalic acid vapor. Um, I, I also got the, the, uh, the wand um, type uh, vaporizer from Bud Willis and treated, but those things take, you know, what, three, four, five minutes to treat a colony. Yeah. And I, I had 20, 30 colonies, I think back then, and that took long enough. There's no way I could use that now. And uh, of course everything has advanced. And now with the instant vap um, from the Robbie's, it's just so much faster and it's really, it's as quick as a lot of the other methods you can use now to, to do that. You just have to do it a few times, but I, I'm a kind of a believer in that as well as, and to be honest, in my case, the Apivar has worked really well for me too. Um, I've tried Formic Pro. It, it seemed to work okay. I didn't have any real problems with that. And I've tried Apigard and I did that once to me. It just seemed like it was, I don't know. It wasn't my favorite. It seemed pretty harsh on the bees the time I did it, but I've only tried it once. And so um, anyway, but that's the thing about it. Yep. You know, I think you'd agree with me that we need to, Everybody's just got to get in the bees and, and figure out what works best for them. Most definitely. I mean, I, I played, here's what's interesting is there was times where I would actually, before I would even put bees in the box after I removed them, I would, I had a way that I could, oh, I set up like it turned the box upside down because it screened. And I mean, I was shooting with OA just, I mean, there were so many different things that I would try. But I've I've not had the opportunity to, to work with most of the other stuff that um, you named off. I just never really never really went down that road. But uh, you know, I've I've just never been afraid to say this, this makes sense in theory. And, and just say this this makes sense. But I wonder, can I manipulate it? Uh, I will tell I will tell people all day long. I just love to see what would change or not change if I did this. Uh -huh. And you know. Run with it. Part, part of my problem 
is I try everything. And then I have a hard time bringing it back down to the simple basics. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. yeah. I just try, I try everything and, and, and everything works to some extent for a while. But when you do that, like in my case, you know, I try the three deep hive system. Now I've got singles and I got deeps and mediums and double deeps and I've got bees on pallets and bees on hive stands and bees going to pollination and honey production colonies and nukes. And after a while, you just have to think, you just drive you crazy. You have to say, how can I, how can I bring it back in? How can I simplify? And what has really worked the best for me in my situation? And in my case, what can I do to be more efficient? Because efficiency is so important. Uh, with yeah. me trying to work my full time job and manage the colonies that I manage, it's just it's just very difficult. And so, this year, I you know I've got a friend down here. You know, I'm Tyler Walker. Um, he's kind of helped me figure out some things as far as some efficiency. He's an incredible uh, young commercial beekeeper that just recently went full time. He manages, I think, fifteen hundred two thousand colonies, and he's doing it full time now. And he does have a little bit of help, but he does a lot of it on his own. And but he is ultra efficient, super hard worker, and he has given me some ideas of things to do. And so. I've implemented some of those things in some of my videos as far as, you know, um, feeding within high feeders to build new splits up and just some different things I've done. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how to be more streamlined and efficient in order to maximize production and minimize the time and effort that goes into it. And I, I still work hard, but it, it seems like I'm getting maybe a little more efficient. And I did not do pollination this year. I decided last year we had a really bad experience with that. Um, I did it for four years. And uh, with the pollination... You know, what we cleared uh, by sending bees out there, and I didn't send many colonies. The most I ever sent, I think, was 52. You know, per colony, what we cleared, you can break a nuke out and sell a nuke and make as much or more. So you have to be feeding them, getting them ready in December, January to hop on a truck and be a full eight-frame colony, you know, by late January. You know, down here in southeast Alabama, about the 1st of January is when they really start to build. You know, that you get the red maple starting to bloom. It's early, but it's, you know, it's not December. So, but they start to build then and they kind of re really begin to hit their stride by mid-January, late January, late January and into early February. And they're really growing by then. But with pollination, you're trying to stimulate them to grow about a month early. So you really never stop. You never slow down. You just got to be building up and, and you're almost artificially stimul stimulating them by feeding them, you know, and it's just kind of, and then you got to get them on the clean pallets, get them on the truck, get them to the the holding yard on the semi truck and it just becomes too much when you can just break out if you want to sell nukes and make that kind of money you can just break out a nuke in the spring and sell nukes and so yeah. i haven't done a lot of that but theoretically you can do that and you'll make more by nuke sales um at least from what we were making you make about the same or more by selling a nuke as you will send them across the country and you have control over your bees they're not out there in somebody else's property uh being managed by somebody else and who knows what the heck's going on in your colonies when you're not there and so i really kind of got away from that but anyway I, I i really appreciate you coming on tonight i think we've had a really a great conversation maybe we can do this again yappy and talk about maybe we can break down each individual uh topic we've discussed a little bit more detail but i wanted to get you on tonight i don't think you need an introduction most people know who you are out there but i did want to bring you on here and talk about just kind of who you are as a beekeeper and i think we did a lot of that also let you introduce a little bit more about honey money tv and I'd encourage people to go subscribe to that channel. Uh, what I always tell people, Yappy, I think you'd agree with this, is to watch the content. If you like what you see, then hit that subscribe button and, and notification bell. At my channel, that's how I feel. I don't want you just to subscribe to, because you're my friend. I want you to subscribe because you like the content and you want to come back and keep watching. That's kind of what I, that's kind of what my belief system is. And so I encourage people when they're checking out a channel just to go watch some of it first and see if you like the content and then roll from there. But I do think we're going for a really, a good ride with Honey Money TV, Yappy, with some of the things that you have, the thought process you have. I've seen you have your uh, your son out there uh, going through bees, and it's just going to be a different approach, and it's going to be really cool. And so I'd like to give you a few minutes just to kind of talk a little bit more about what your plans are in the future, uh, Yappy, and with Honey Money TV and moving forward. Well, I appreciate that. I've, I've had an absolute great time as far as talking with you with you tonight. Hopefully, there, there's so much more to every point when we talk about something. You, you throw in a a bullet point at somebody in just one kind of a blip is, is an idea that can be, it can be taken in as a seed. It can grow and, and you kind of manage and, and let that, let that become something to you individually, but there's always so much more that goes to it. Um, I've made, I made a comment on live stream last night where I don't have a problem with, uh, um, you know, maybe catching a smaller swarm and pulling a queen out of it, doing something with it. And I can take three pounds of bees and add them to, a colony somewhere 
and after the after the live stream uh i spoke with somebody that was watching they said you know but what if that what if that swarm that you catch you know came from a colony that had uh foul brood or something or you know and you had this issue with it and i said well the only way that you could potentially not ha not have that is you know if you were buying like inspected bee packages that you get from somewhere that you know go through this whole process i said that's not that's that's neither here nor there for me because i know the bees in my state my area there's been for example there's been no to my understanding there's been no known cases of american fowl brood in alabama in over eight years so if that's the case that's the least of my worries just like uh, there's no known cases of Africanized bees in the state of Alabama. We could have some very pissy bees, but there's no Africanized bees here because you understand that. And, you know, we take we take risks, but my management thought processes um, have meaning behind it. And this the Honey Money channel is now going to allow me to kind of throw some of these ideas at people. I will. Oh, I want new beekeepers. If you've been doing it, mean, Bruce has been doing this for oh my God, 10 years, 12 years, you're 11, up there. 11, yeah, 11, 11 years. years. So he, he has done his homework on processes or uh, signs, symptoms, treatments. There, there's, there's so many things that Bruce has gone through. There's so many that I've gone through and, and so many people that are out there. But the one thing that I hope to share is not this is how you make a split or that I'm not going to go out there and say, well, this is how I would do this particular type split or whatever, whatever, whatever. I want to, to really drill into people's heads, especially these newer beekeepers, to start out with a management process. Learn what managing is. Develop a process for yourself in so many different ways. Um, aspects both in the, in the financials in the goals and in the treatment of your colonies and develop that process and then you will i believe you will have a more successful growth in your yard if you were to do that and honey money tv as a separate channel from yappy is going to really give me an opportunity to connect with uh, people that have known me for years and they may get in there and watch some of it and I, I wished i could say something that was just so awesome that bruce would even go wow i never thought of that but well, i'm sure you will somewhere it may come to it i may say 50 things that you already knew but i i can't wait for you to call me up one day and go you know yep you got me on that one i i'm just looking at something not that there's not that everybody's failing in not in any aspect that's not being taught um i just want to i just want to give what has worked for me how I go about it, what my thought processes are. And then if people out there feel that that's something that benefits them and it, and it clicks for them, then it was well worth it. If, if not, then once, you know, we'll, the channel's going to grow just like Yappy Bee Man did. It's going to grow and it's going to improve with everything. At the end of the day, it's, it is also just a version of production value. But it's going it, to, it just, it allows me to communicate and actually interact with people that I haven't been able to for 10 years. Other than when I go to a conference or a club and, and, I, and I see people that I get to shake hands with, this is just a, a, another form of interaction that I'm looking forward to. And I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the where I can. Awesome, man. And the last thing I'd like to ask you, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, Greg was down here. He visited him and Mike Berry came over and Dirt Roost came and hang out with us a little bit. And we had dinner with some people. And at the time, Greg was going around asking a question. And, uh, the question was, what is it about those bugs in a box? And that's really a pretty cool question. And, and my response, at least part of it, was that when I look in a beehive, I feel like there's something divine about that. There's a there's a greater power. There's something at work there that, that is just incredible. And I guess, Yappy, to kind of close this thing out, I'm going to ask Greg's question. Uh, what is it about those bugs in a box? I'm going to say this. You could not have said it any better in in regards to it being something so divine so i i think i've shared this a little bit and this is what i'm going to answer every time a beehive is the perfect example of society i used to think that a beehive was basically a fish tank with no water because as a, when i was younger i used to love to just stare at a bee at a i used to love to stare at a aquarium I had a 55 gallon aquarium fish all just doing their thing and it was just so meditative so calming to watch and then when the time came and i had my first beehive it it did that same thing i i, I just was mesmerized at something that i was that i was interacting with through nature but the more that i learned and the more that i interacted with 
and I actually tried to understand the bug as a colony, it taught me this. No single bee does anything for itself. It does it for the entire collective. It does it, it does it to get through its day and make it make the one next to it, you know, assist it, do whatever to make its day easier. But its its ultimate goal is to provide for its future. If it doesn't do anything today, it potential and, and more bees don't do anything today, then it is a detriment to the future of that entire colony. One of the things that is so beautiful about a bee colony is that if you anybody that's everybody that's probably listening to this more than likely keeps bees. And you, if you haven't yet, you are going to experience a swarm. You're going to understand that your bees will split in half because that's what nature told them to do. It was their intent to recreate themselves. But when I say recreate themselves, we look at different things, whether it be through church, whether it be through our politics, or whether it be through our football teams. Um, I generally, I will use the example of church. When a church splits, it's because somebody got mad. They decided that I didn't like the, what the preacher said today or what the songs they sang or different things like that. So a church goes and splits. When a beehive splits, it doesn't do it because it's mad at their queen. They don't kick her out and half of them, t- you know, take her off and go move her somewhere else. They split because they want to create an identical same them. They don't, when they get to the new location, they don't vote and say, well, you know, before we get this thing started, I didn't like the way we did this back there. We should change that. They don't vote and they don't do anything. They create an identical self and they continue on. Their processes are perfect and they, and they will continue to do them throughout without change. And when you learn those processes and you get to respect that, it is such an example of what we as society could actually be and and grow and, and become so much better if we just looked at the example and tried to duplicate it. Well said, my friend. Appreciate you coming on tonight, man. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very um, happy and excited that you got to have me on here. I mean, this to see to see Bruce from way little Bruce. OK, with his open air colony to now being uh one of the uh one of the three members of the the best stream out there the stream team guys and the interconnection there but also just to see the growth in your channel over these years and and how well it's done um and in your content and how things have improved in the content uh, your, the information that you gain the information you share you're you're you are giving back um and and that's something that i respect i, I will always support this channel because you do everything you can to share that knowledge and give back and and you know the only thing you ask for is a thumbs up so on the way out folks don't forget to hit that thumbs up but all right thanks again man y'all take care and we'll catch you next time roll tide roll tide